Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. And thanks to everyone who put this together. It seems like such a large group of people um, bringing all of you here. Um, so it's a great opportunity. I hope to learn as much as, as you all do. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the future of human-computer interaction. Um, that's what my research group does. Um, I'm a cognitive psychologist, as Allison told you, so I have a slightly different bent. I'm not a computer scientist, although we have a very multidisciplinarian group with designers, sociologists, psychologists, and computer scientists all working together to, to try to reinvent the future. And I went to some slides. Why am I not progressing here? I went to some slides that actually Ben Peterson and I uh, were on a panel uh, for the 20 year celebration of the Human Computer Interaction Lab at Carnegie Mellon. And I went back to those 2006 slides um, to see kind of like how far have we come since 2006. And much to my um, um, delight, actually, a lot of the stuff that we had predicted might be happening in the future is happening. And so I'm actually starting from, from these slides from 2006 um, and expanding on them. Um, obviously, you know, back in 2006, large displays were a big topic. Uh, we're going to have displays everywhere, you know, multiple monitors. You're going to be sitting in front of, you know, a flight deck, basically. Uh, and that's kind of happened. We do have more displays on walls now, and they are bigger. And we are able to show really interesting things with these large displays. They've been a great enabler uh, of new software designs, actually. And, you know, we said there were going to be ubiquitous sensors, sensors everywhere. Um, well, you know, I've got my Fitbit on here. Um, I track myself every day. I used to wear the body media, but that was a little bit too big, and I was allergic to the nickel. Fitbit is much nicer. Um, so maybe that is coming. And, you know, you've got GPS in your phone. And so sensors are starting to become ubiquitous after all. Uh, I talked about wearables and implantables, you know, that we'd have, you know, biochips in our wrists. Um, that's not quite here yet, but I do think that will come. Um, making us better and, and storing information in maybe in a more easy to use way. Enough storage for a lifetime of data. I think it's easy to say that that's actually here. Um, power salvaging. So um, a lot of research is going on right now to detect what activities you're doing on your phone. So if you're not using your phone, you know, in a way that's really power hungry, you can shut it down and save the battery. So there's a lot of new innovation in that space. Um, I love this one because new materials. I don't even know what I was thinking when I wrote that, but in fact, the designer in my group is working on computational materials and putting computers in your clothing. And can we do things uh, to you to notify you or to you know, show you when you're stressed by the color of your clothing and, and stuff like that? And she's actually making a lot of progress. Um, I don't know if many of you, have any of you seen the new t-shirts you can wear that check at your heart rate and collect, you know, um, your, your gal galvanic skin response, for instance. So I think it's fair to say this stuff is coming. I know hospitals now are, are having patients wear some of these new t-shirts. Um, and then access to personal bits anywhere, anytime. Well, I believe Allison put all our talks in Dropbox. Uh, I, I, I think we kind of do have access to anything most of the time if we can find it. Right, Dan? Okay, so I just thought I'd collect some of this stuff that's out on the web. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, products now that you can wear and get your EEG signal and collect that. You know, collect that every day if you want or collect that while you're using particular programs. Researchers can use that to study how easy software is. Um, there's the emotive device, the Effectiva device that collects your galvanic skin response. I've been wearing that every day for uh, many, many weeks, and it's very accurate. It actually really shows when I'm aroused and interested and when I'm really, really bored. And then I can go back to my, my file tracker and look and see at my logger. What have I been doing that got me so aroused and made me so bored? And that's very fascinating. Um, down below, I have a series of input and output innovations um, invented by Desney Chan and his team. Um, where, you know, projectors now can project to your body. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Maybe you just, instead of using a phone, you just tap on your hand to write to into that phone number. Um, they actually got this little um, device that you put in your mouth. It's kind of like a retainer. They actually got that to the point where Greg in our group, who's in a wheelchair, could actually steer his wheelchair with his tongue. Tongue's actually really strong and quite movable. Um, so there are lots of innovations there. They've been working on um, 
displays that you can wear um, as kind of like contact lenses. They call them bionic lenses. Um, and that technology is moving along at a rapid pace. So stuff could be projected into your eye for you. Um, and they've done a series of things looking at bioacoustics of your arm as you tap them wearing wireless armbands. Um, also detecting which muscles you use in your fingers. And that can be sent to your, to your computer, maybe a, in a wireless, well, definitely in a wireless way. And so really new novel input and output techniques are being invented every day. It's actually kind of hard to keep up. And at Microsoft, you know, in 2007, we actually talked about, you know, the surface computer was going to change everything. And then in 2009, uh, Natal was invented, which is the Connect, as you may know it as a commercial product, uh, where many, many research labs worked together with the Xbox team uh, to invent you are the controller, right? So you just use your body. How many people have used the Connect? Yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's enabled a lot of really cool new things I'll talk about in just a minute. And then we have a designer in my group, as I said, who's really interested in fabric. And she invented this new way of, she calls this the printing dress, a takeoff on the printing press. And uh, you are what you tweet. So basically, you can't see the bodice of the dress in this particular picture, but there's a keyboard on the bodice of the dress. And as you tweet, it actually works. Uh, there's a projection of what you're tweeting that comes up on your skirt. <laughs> and she won best of show uh, at wearables and a most creative award for this dress. It's quite beautiful, but now she's doing really much more innovative and advanced things with this. So bottom line is there's a lot of hardware out there that's really influencing a ton of change. And it's coming. Um, the move, I don't, I don't know, how many of you know the quantified self movement? A few, not too many. Okay, the quantified self-movement is a movement of people out there, I, I think I'm one of them, that really believes in logging themselves, wearing sensors and logging themselves. And they do this for the pur purposes of not only tracking their lives, but improving their lives. That's the idea behind this. You should be healthier and happier. And so the sensors are here. You, can, you have these people now who are wearing headbands and, and all kinds of different stuff. Um, but we need the software in order to actually make sense of all this data. So we're going to be collecting tons of data about ourselves um, and logging everything we do, logging everything our body does. Um, and without machine learning, there's just no way to make sense of all these streams of data. So we have the databases now that are capable of collecting this data. We can get access to it anywhere, anyhow. Um, but really now the challenge for my group, I see it as information visualization of all this data. How do you access it? How do you make sense of it? How do you present it to the user in a very um, aesthetically pleasing and, and easy to use way? And so we spend a lot of our time on that. Um, one of the things that I will say is a challenge is there are different ways of presenting this data if you're talking about a personal presentation to myself for reflection versus the kind of data that you might want to share with someone, like let's say a very small private group of your loved ones or your doctor or your healthcare professionals, things like that. So there's a, a very different take on how abstract you want to go. And now I think, you know, with the, the advent of social software, uh, and the ability for us to collaborate effectively in editing documents, in creating world knowledge, in developing new tools. Um, this is a really great opportunity, and so I see this as one of the key influencers as well. So what are some of the scenarios? Um, obviously, in, if we invent anything in these spaces, much as Dan was, was great to show you, you need to do user-centered design, right? So we need to study at the various levels that Dan was talking about how easy these things are to use. But let's say you get prototypes for like healthcare. Um, so the first thing we're working on right now is actually something to help with mental health. So we have a bunch of sensor data, we have connect data, so we see how far you're you're leaning into your computer, if your face is smiling or, or not smiling. We can do the prosody of your speech. Are, are you really talking very fast and anxiously or are you talking kind of slow and calmly? So we can look at all these sensor streams and put together a story about you and your state of being, um, which is great. And we can show that back to you. We can even show it to you in a beautiful visualization that helps you make sense of how you spent your last week because you probably don't remember a lot of what happened. If it's today, you might not remember two days ago. Um, and so that's great. We can do this for health. And, and we do do user studies to make sure that this is you know, private enough and sensitive enough and yet easy to understand. 
Um, and you know, some of the things we've thought about are you know, road rage detectors. Like if we have this in the car, can we tell that you're getting really stressed out and do something soothing or calming or at least remind you to take a deep breath, something like that. There's all kinds of possibilities now that we have all this sensor data and we have the ability to, to summarize it and make sense of it. I think it's really important that we use some of these tools to personalize user interfaces for people. As Dan pointed out, not everybody is at the same level of expertise as everybody else. And there are some things that you're just frankly more interested in than others. And we can, you know, proffer those up to you and save you time in your searching and making sense of your own sensor streams. Um, one of the things we've been really interested in in my group is using this information for improving um, and prioritizing work for work groups. Again, this gets very sensitive because how do you show information you know about your individual co-workers and what they're working on in a way that's private, sensitive, and yet really helps the whole team function better? Um, privacy is an issue throughout everything we're doing these days uh, in my research group. And um, my question to all of you, I'm jumping the gun, Allison, is <laughs> what are you all doing uh, with us to help make sure that these, these logs and these visualizations of all this information actually are treated sensitively and privacy is secured. That's a really, really tough problem. And the last thing I put in here is it should be that if you can track user emotion and frustration and, and stress, and we can, can you use it to improve teaching? And so that's another opportunity for all of you out here that are in the educational domain um, you know, if you could detect if your students were stressed out or frustrated, what would you do about that? How would you handle that? And how would you want that information displayed to you? We actually did a project um, on, on trying to teach fifth and sixth graders how to search better. And we used large displays, going back to these hardware opportunities, to show the teacher and the rest of the kids in the room who was searching for what. So basically a big tag cloud of the words they were using, a big tag cloud of the URLs that they were um, going to. And this allowed the teacher very quickly to see what kids were doing. Of course, the first thing kids do is they try to get their name up there as big as they possibly can. And you know, they usurp the technology for their own delight. But um, you know, the teacher was able to actually go in and then look at individual students. What are individual students doing? Oh, this individual student has really, you know, they're on a good, good run searching for this information. Let's, let's show everyone else what this student's doing. Um, and the students really used this. It was amazing to watch in the actual class where they were teaching about search how this tool was um, enlightening them and they were leveraging. They would see new keywords that they hadn't thought of before and they would use them themselves. So I think there's just tons of opportunity for using this kind of software, using large displays, using logs and trackers, still maintaining privacy and being sensitive to improve the classroom opportunity. Oops, I think I went too fast. How do I go back? This mouse is not working. Somebody? Okay, I hope that's the same. Okay, so what are the implications of all this? We're gonna have more self-awareness. Um, really, we really are gonna have fantastic tools for reflection. We really are trying to build these things so that you can personally learn about the events in your life and which events are really positive and helpful and important to you and which events maybe aren't so good and maybe you can learn from these reflection user interfaces or maybe we, there are things we can do in real time that you can show to your loved ones or your healthcare professionals uh, that really help you get, get better help or at least you know, allow your social network to intervene and help you. So, these self-awareness tools can be built at multiple scales, right? They're gonna be the personal self-reflection tools for you, but also at the enterprise scale. So one of the things I, I joke with, and I have a slide on in a minute, is Microsoft spends, and I'm sure every large corporation like Google, spends billions of dollars on making sure that your, your workforce is healthy. Well, there are things we can do right now that would save a ton of money, but you know, at what level are people willing to share this information? It's, it's an important question. Um, and you know, the idea would be we'll have more free time if we can learn all this stuff and see all this stuff. Or maybe with that free time, what we'll re recognize is that there are better things we could be doing, more healthy things, more positive things, better ways to spend our time. But there's a dark side. And again, this has some questions for all of you. Um, corporations 
all big corporations now know a lot about what you do with their software. Um, and they use that. Actually, they use that to personalize the software for you. But they also use that for other reasons, to serve up better ads, to give you better experiences, and it, it really influences your experience of how you consume information. They are ma they're making it malleable based on your behaviors. And we have to ask ourselves as a society, how comfortable are we with you know, large organizations and small organizations, any product actually that's logging you, shaping your experience on the web? Are we okay with that as a society? Or would we prefer to be in charge of that? And what kind of tools can we work on as a community to give people more control over how they consume information? And, you know, how will we protect users' privacy? I, this is just something that's really bothering me right now. How do we keep the data secure? And, you know, is it going to be that sci-fi-ish kind of situation where at some point we're not okay with this and we just have to jump off the grid? I already know people who, ref you know, they just turned off Facebook, turned off Twitter, just don't want it anymore. And, you know, I would hope that we don't have to get to that point. I would hope that um, as a society and a government and a policy-making um, situation that we really protect users and give users more control. Um, and that's part of the user experience. It's part of making the user experience better. So I'm going to leave you all with those questions, the dark side, um, and open it up for questions. Thank you.